Welcome to the first episode of Series 57, everybody. Our final series of 2022. We are covering Ryutama, finally. But first, a quick note on what to expect during and after the show. Some of you have probably noticed that there are now officially ads in your feeds. If you haven't yet, you probably will soon. This is part of the network's move to a new hosting service, and revenue from those ads allows the network to keep running and for shows to keep bringing you great stuff. If you are interested in ad-free episodes, you can get those as a character creation cast patron. Um, we'll have more info in about that both in our show notes and in our call to action at the end. Mm -hmm. So stay tuned after the episode to hear us also thank those people that have already signed up to our Patreon, uh, including a brand new patron this week. Woo! Woo! And uh, to also hear about how you can vote for Amelia's guest spot on the Kill Every Monster podcast uh, in the Audioverse Awards. Until then, enjoy the show. Welcome to Character Creation Cast, a show where we discuss and create characters, the best part of role-playing games, with guests using their favorite systems. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan, and this episode, my co-host Amelia and I are thrilled to welcome Amber Seeger from the Tabletop Babble podcast. Amber uses they, them pronouns, and this series, we are going to be covering the game Ryutama, a cozy rules light system created by Atsuhiro Okada. Welcome to Character Creation Cast, Amber. We are so excited that you're here. Hi, thank you guys so much for inviting me on the show. Ryutama is like probably, if not my favorite RPG, like in the top three. It's been on our list since the beginning. And I've had yeah. several friends that are like, have you not covered it yet? And it's like, yeah, like, I I know, I know. <laughs> There's only so <laughs> many promise. games we can cover we in a year. <laughs> I promise. <laughs> Um, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself, uh, the projects you're involved in, where people can find you? Yeah, so uh, you can find pretty much all of my information on my website, uh, which is rocketorca.com. And that includes like my graphic design portfolio, Etsy, social media links, all of that. I'm most active on Twitter, Tumblr, and Instagram. And my handle across pretty much all of those things is going to be Rocket Orca or Rocket Orca art of some variant. So if you just put Rocket Orca in somewhere, you'll find me. Um, <laughs> so I kind of alluded to it. I'm a graphic designer, um, but I also in the last year started my own indie TTRPG publishing company mm, uh, called cool. Cloud Curio. And what we're doing there is we're putting out a lot of system neutral gem tools like items, room cities, adventures, and Right now, the major project we're working on that I'd like to talk about is a, mm, a system-neutral monster GM prep tool. So it's like all of the stories behind the stat blocks. Like you can find stat blocks anywhere, but like how do you tell better stories narratively with monsters mm. and that project is called monstrous and we're working with my friend kyle latino who is also part of cloud curio and he's most known for his youtube uh, channel called map Crow. so we'll be working on that this coming year through 2023 and i hope i we're crowdfunding September 2023. That is the hope. So Very cool. <laughs> if you want to find information about that, that website is thecloudcurio.com. Amazing. Very cool. Thank you. Well, let's go ahead and get into this. Uh, we're going to start by discussing what this game is all about. What's in a game? All right. So what is the core concept of Ryotama? So... I was first introduced to Ryutama. My partner, Brandon, at Gen Con saw it on a bookshelf at the Indie Press Revolution booth. And when he handed it to me, the concept that was he pitched, it was like, this is all about traveling. This is mm. all about like going off and it's it's about the journey. You know how that expression, it's it's not the destination, it's the journey along the way. Yeah. Yes. That's kind of how I pitch Ryutama to people. Okay. Gorgeous art too. Oh, yeah. Game. Like... 
if you are a manga anime studio ghibli fan this aesthetically will appeal to you Mm -hmm. absolutely uh got some big final fantasy tactics vibes as well i have never played a final fantasy game (laughs) i've played final fantasy 3 when it was released on the ds and that was the last time i uh (laughs) played a final fantasy game i am i do like so a lot of times i come into these games and everybody's like here's this cultural touchstone and amelia's like cool what's that um (laughs) amelia lived a very sheltered life um but i do (laughs) i do know the ghibli films because i have been watching those uh with my kids right now because now they're all on streaming now so i can finally watch them um so i do look at this amelia has a cultural touchstone <laughs> we got yeah, there, I, always, I always worry about that when I'm like, hey, this is like X. And it's like, oh, but do you actually know what X is, though? Mm-hmm. Uh, what what mm-hmm. do I what do I pull from next? It's right. really difficult sometimes. Mm-hmm. But yeah, this is definitely of that genre. And not just Final Fantasy. I think like if you've ever played you know, Super Mario RPG or JRPGs in general on mm-hmm. video games, this game has a lot of that feel to it. Like when I am running it, I always envision like people traveling like the overworld view through stuff. Oh, yeah. And then, mm-hmm. you know, they run into a monster or like even Pokemon is kind of like that too, yeah. where it's like you you go through little towns and stuff mm-hmm. and then ooh, 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 monster battle. Mm-hmm. Um, that's kind of the feel and flavor of mechanically how Ryutama works. Okay. Cool. Cool. Very nice. So can you tell us a little bit about the setting of this game. Um, it feels so far I've gotten like kind of the gist that it's like a, a little more cozy than some of the the just like, you know, wander along fight monster kind of games. Yeah. So I think naturally just because of what the core concept is where you're it's traveling that kind of like informs the kind of setting that you're going to, you know, start building around or or your players are going to, you know, play in, right? Um, so a lot of the stuff is going to be geared toward wilderness or, or monster battles, or I don't know, like towns and stuff are going to be set up knowing that there are travelers or adventures coming through, uh, the setting, there is no core setting to Ryotama. So Mm. when you first get this book, you're not going to open it up and like, you're going to find lore and worlds Mm. already built for you. Like the whole core con, like it's, it's going to be creating your own setting with your table before you start playing it. And there's actually rules and um, uh, like worksheets to go through to actually create like towns and world and that kind of stuff. But the only thing that it, the game itself says that has to be core to your setting is that you go on these adventures. Traveling is a part of like, it's an ancient custom custom at some point in time in somebody's life, they're just going to uproot themselves and go out and enjoy a journey and a travel. Cool. So that is the only thing that this game says has to be part of your setting. Okay. Okay. Very cool. Uh, what tools then do we need to actually play the game? So you'll actually need a full set of dice. And that's because mechanically the way this game is set up, your stats are represented by a die. Mm-hmm. Um, and so as you level, your die will increase in size. And that's how you kind of like level up. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, okay. I, you know, your character sheets, of course, pencils, um, a battle map, uh, because the way that combat works in this game is, is you actually have to have a map in front of you that just shows in the area like there's a close range area and a far range area and that's all you need there's not like you know five feet square distance it's just you're in the front or you're in the back Mm -hmm. um and yeah post-it notes your general just regular game stuff but that's really all you need dice pen paper Mm. and your imagination (laughs) and friends and pizza and and, yeah yes Mm -hmm. yeah the usuals So what kind of stories and themes do you think that this game um, is meant to explore or in in your experience, like best explores too? The really fun, unique thing about Ryutama is that the GM also gets to make a character. It's called a Ryujin. And there are four different ones that you can choose from in the game. Mm. And each one of them has their own like, like, you, if you pick the blue dragon, Ryujin, you're going to tell stories that are of friendship or, you know, human connection. If you choose the 
red region. You're going to be telling stories about combat and struggle. Or mm. if you're doing the black region, maybe it's about death or more melancholy oh, cool. stuff. Uh, the green dragons, more about like discovery and uh, fresh starts. And what's cool about the Ryujin, too, is that they actually have these spells that they can cast at the beginning of a session that then can flavor the the session's, like, story and themes. And, like, some of my favorite stuff is from the Ryujin is I can tell the, the table I'm casting X spell today. And it's a spell that if you guys narrate a scene where you're talking about your past like life or your home or something nostalgic, you'll get X benefit. Mm -hmm. So the Ryujin's powers not only flavor the kind of story you're going to tell for the whole campaign, but they can also infle uh, they can also influence the actual session storytelling as well and kind of like get your players to role play a little bit more. Very, Very cool. cool. So uh, aside from traveling, uh, what do characters do in this game? So when I, I proposed this game to my group of players, because I actually record, this is like the first game I ever ran a campaign in. Okay. And I was very nervous. Um, it's all recorded on my Shapeshift podcast. So if you want to hear how Ryutama uh, plays out and me running my first game ever, uh, you could go to Shapeshift, uh, it's at geekspective.com. Um I was like, you're going to basically, if you watch like Lord of the Rings, mm -hmm. the, the entire time they're traveling, I mean, it's a lot of character interaction. So I told them, I was like, you're going to need to learn how to like talk with each other and like how to narrate like those downtime moments. Like there's a whole the a whole kind of, I don't want to say it's not a theory. It's like a sense sensibility. I don't know. There's a Japanese word called ma that I think Hayao Miyazaki, right? Miyazaki, he talks about this, this thing called ma, the, the silence in between like situations and stuff mm -hmm. and just being mm -hmm. slow. So a lot of the times in the stories I was telling, it would center around like, what are you guys doing? Or how do you chop the wood? Or what do you see when you chop the wood? And like that kind of stuff. But when you're actually mechanically journeying in Ryotama, there are series of checks, right? There's journey rules. And it's a way to mechanically help you tell the story as well. So for instance, let me pull out my GM notebook that I have over here <laughs> that has the journey rules that I made in a cheat sheet for myself. So not to go too deep into the mechanics right now, but basically when you're traveling, they're going to start their day out doing a, condi uh, doing a condition check which is to see, how are you feeling today? Did you sleep okay? Now, narrative, narratively describe how you are going to be affected this day. Did you have a headache? Did you, you know, is there a crick in your neck? Is your back sore? Then they'll do a travel check and that is how well they actually made it through the terrain because terrain is a big thing in Ryutama too. There's actually, you know, I'm talking a lot about the narrative stuff, but there is a lot of mechanical stuff to this game as well. So they'll they'll do that kind of check to see how well they actually traversed. Uh, then they'll do a direction check to then just like, did you get lost? Do you know where you're going? Um, what happened? And then they'll actually, when they are done traveling for a day, do a camp check. How well did you set up camp? Did you find food? And so you're basically narrating these, these days together. Um, and as a GM, you know, you're going to be asking a lot of questions about how does this affect your character or, or tell me what it's like, what do you cook for dinner? Mm -hmm. um, and of course, you know, with the Ryujin having those spells too, if the characters are being asked, they know that they can get double XP or double X gold for doing some sort of role play, that kind of is there too. And of course, as a GM... You can drop encounters, you know, if they did a really bad direction check. I mean, that's a great time to say, like, ah, oh, you stumble into a nest of walking eggs, you know, like yeah. that kind of stuff. And then the whole that's but that's the main focus is that kind of stuff. So that's what characters will be mostly doing. Okay. Um, but again, it really depends on your group, right? Like yeah. my group loves social interaction. So we ended up doing a lot of stuff in towns. <laughs> 
and right. talking to NPCs. That's interesting. It, it feels like it flips the formula on its head where I was just going to say, it's like everything people are doing in D&D that D&D isn't made to do. Right. It's right. all of the things that people are like, here's what I love about my D&D game. And you're like, that's super cool. None of that is in the books. <laughs> This uh-huh. is like, like your game is not representative of what D and D actually is, yeah. and this feels like, yeah, like the opposite of that. Like everything that D and D is not doing is like, here's all the rules for while yeah. you're traveling and all of the things yeah. you stumble along and what you're doing during those long rests and yeah. like, you know, because usually it's are having. usually it's chunk of adventure and then a yeah. little bit of downtime and then more adventure then a little bit of downtime. Yeah. This right. feels like it's a lot of downtime. And a little bit of adventure and and kind of in that that sort of cadence, which is really Yeah, this is like more my speed. Cause like did you ever like listen to D D games or like, you know, actual plays or whatever, and you're like, this sounds so exhausting. Yes. Like like after like a long day where I'm just like, it was one thing after another. And you're like, I couldn't live like that for uh-huh. like yeah. that long. You know? Yeah. Like this mm-hmm. sounds more like what I would this is what adventuring would be like for Amelia. <laughs> like, yeah, this is like Amelia level adventuring. It's like sometimes uh, stuff happens, uh-huh. other times friends. <laughs> yeah, we always had we. I have a lot of fond memories of playing this game with my first group because my brother was in it too, uh, and so that was really uh, special for me because he's a really good role player and just really goofy. And he picked a character. He made a character that. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about the character creation stuff later, but like he specifically made a cook. He just wanted to have a traveling chef. And his whole like reason for journeying was to collect all these ingredients because he wanted to become a better chef and he mm. wanted to do that kind of stuff. And so it's another thing that characters will have when you do character creation. You're going to pick your reason to journey. Like, why did you decide to go on this journey? What is the What was the purpose? What was the point? Mm-hmm. Which also really helps a GM and what, you know, I can put in, or if you're GMing, how to put things in for your character or your, your players, right? right? Like, I made sure that my brother's character always had opportunity to try cooking with different things. Now, he would do checks and to see if he could cook stuff really well. And there'd always be a... You know, he's sitting around the campfire and he's going to crush up some moths and add some weird fungus that he put together. And he's going to try and feed everybody this. And that made really fun <laughs> character like interaction stuff as well. Yeah. Like, how they reacted to him. And then if somebody ate it, did they get sick the next day? Yep. You know, <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I like I like when games offer opportunities like that, because I think um, we've talked about it before, but it, there is a lot of onus on a GM to like make a game that just like magically includes everybody and i i like when character creation offers like offers players a chance to say here are the hooks that would be interesting for me as a player mm-hmm. like yeah. i have made this character and in making that character i have shown you what things i'm interested in and what things you as a gm can do to like make this game fun for me mm-hmm. yeah what do you think makes ryutama unique to other role-playing games that you've played i mean we already touched on the big the big one that i think is super obvious which is that the gm actually gets to make a basically a character to not necessarily play with the characters right like i you it actually specifically warns like you're not a part of the party you're just kind of like your little avatar that's following the group is there just outside of you know their periphery outside of their vision but they're it's kind of like guarding them through their journey Mm. which i loved because it's like for several reasons one i felt like i got to influence the story i had something to actually like give me foundation for making story stuff like okay now i'm picking this region i'm going to tell stories about adventure and discovery and here are the things i get to pick Ooh, here's how i can use these spells in a way to have my players role play with each other Mm -hmm. or you know my my partner Brandon he loved the diary uh spell like there was like one that's like if they recount a story about their their past or you know whatever writes a letter home they get x gold for the Mm -hmm. session and so over time he ended up having this really nice collection of letters that he had written throughout the game, which was nice to have like this like artifact at the end of a game, right? Mm-hmm. Like I made this during the game. Mm-hmm. Um, 
So I think that's like the major one. Um, the next thing is like mechanically, it really does play, like I said before, like a JRPG. Mm -hmm. um, the checks are very loosey, like I don't say loosey goosey, but it's more like there's no set like list of like do a perception check or do a wisdom check. It's mm -hmm. like, like one of my characters wanted to go fishing. And I was like, well, what skills do you think require fishing and he was like and then in Ryutama there's only four st stats there's spirit mm -hmm. strength dexterity and intelligence mm -hmm. and he's like well I think it would be uh dexterity and intelligence it's like all right roll me your dex die roll me your int die and let's see how you do well, your target number is going to be you know it's difficult so you know type of fish you're trying to get do this I liked that kind of thing like I don't really have to remember like a list of skills. This skill keys players. off of this stat. And we were having a discussion about that in our Discord recently, too, about people talking about it's it's really frustrating when you get into games and you have sort of like dump stats or you have these things that like you just never get to use. So it's mm -hmm. like, you know, every bard ends up looking somewhat the same because it only, you know, behooves right. you to put things into these stats and mm -hmm. like we were talking about trying to find games where you can say, well, if I go about doing it in this way, I should, you know, it's like if I do it intelligently or if I do it dexterously mm -hmm. or if, like, how do you approach it? And then how does that affect the result of like, OK, if I did it quickly versus doing it intelligently, yeah. you know, does that get me a different result, too? And I love games that kind of let you say, here's here's how I think I would go about it. And then being able to just make the check based on what you're doing rather than mm -hmm. what the like optimal stat is. Yeah. See, I, I would have gone with endurance and spirit for fishing. Oh, yeah, yeah. because uh, it's fishing is an endurance sport and oh, it takes forever. <laughs> you gotta stay awake. <laughs> right. You gotta, you gotta stay awake. So, yeah. so yeah, for me, that totally <laughs> sounds like this is a test of my ADHD, which is definitely endurance and spirit. So... Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then but then you get a narr and then you get to narrate that, right? right? Which is like a huge which adds more to like your character and like the story and like right. showing who your character is and how they approach things. So I really, really love that. And that it was a discussion. Like I as a GM wasn't just going, no, fishing is just strength and decks. Yeah. Right. You know, and, and it's like, and well, like now because I'm not strong, I can never go fishing. Right. Right. Like, exactly. You know, like I'm always going to fail at this. And, you know, it, it's it's frustrating as a player. It's like it's yeah. not fun to play that mm -hmm. way. But speaking of failing, <laughs> <laughs> yes. If yes. you fail in Ryutama, you get what's or you get a fumble. Like if you like fail, like one, you roll one one, right? Like you get two ones, you fumble. And everybody in the group, including you, gets a fumble point. That mm. means they watched you fail <laughs> and then they learn from your failing and then you also learn from your failing and then you get to use this one point to then add to anything later on. Oh, nice. I love games that do that, that like encourage, not encourage failure, but like I've, I've played with so many people that are like, I'm going to fudge my rules or I'm only going to roll things that I know I can win at or, you know, that because failure is so unsatisfying for them and and I can totally understand that frame of mind that, mm -hmm. like especially when you come into a game you're like I don't want to suck at this right so right. like I love yeah. games that say you know what you didn't do the thing that you wanted to do but something does still happen there is some benefit you've mm -hmm. grown in some way you've gotten something so that it doesn't feel like such a like waste of time or mm -hmm. you know you don't have yeah. that disappointment level it, it's always so funny too because it's like once you embrace the fact that like failing have like it can one it can be funny like it's right. mm -hmm. to sure. me failing can be I love absolutely it. hilarious in a game failing. yeah uh, I do too I I just love watching my characters struggle <laughs> I, I do too I like and I don't know I'm like is there something sadistic about that maybe that like I should explore with my therapist or something yeah. but also like I'm just gonna keep doing it and we're gonna yeah, hope it's yeah. fine right yeah. but it's <laughs> but it was so funny once my table like understood the like the greatness of the failing and the fumble like people would fumble and they'd be like yes right? yeah, we all get a point right. uh, we all get a point and also now we get to narrate this ridiculous setup of like yeah. uh, of why did it how did it go so wrong yeah. and 
how are they going to then scramble to kind of like set mm-hmm. everything back on its path? So, like, uh oh, what were those mushrooms actually? Though? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's interesting. I, I played a game recently, I forget the name of it, but it, it has a mechanic where you set your attributes in this grid. And as you use the attributes, your dice pool goes away. Eventually, you're left with nothing in the grid. But Ooh. when you roll a one on your result, then the grid replenishes. So you have and to fail at everything. At so you point. have to fail eventually in order oh, to get cool. your stats back. Right. Huh. So we were we were playing and for the like the longest time of the session, nobody rolled a one. But as soon as that first one came out, we're like, yeah, yes, <laughs> yes. finally <laughs> failed real bad. <laughs> Look at me failing. Hooray. <laughs> Yeah, and I know some of that is like always about like group di- group dynamics and the people that you play with and like yeah. why why you come to these games certainly. Yeah, right. Um, but yeah, I do love that feeling of like, oh, it went real bad. What happens now? I know. Like, yeah, <laughs> I love it too. I try to. I'm, I'm also trying to think of the other unique things about this this game. So I said the the region, the mechanic, like the int stuff, the failing. I also think it's like the character classes are very interesting. Um, they are very different from like what you would expect from like, you know, a fantasy. There, of course, there's like, going to be like a minstrel and like a yeah. magic user. But then there's like a farmer. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, which I also liked uh, because it this game really pushes like, like it doesn't, if, I want to say it's mechanic, it's crunchy enough to like, keep people who love mechanics involved but not so crunchy that like it becomes unwieldy mm-hmm. but like carrying capacity is a thing um making sure your rations and your water you know you have to keep track of that like you also assign roles to your traveling party so that's another unique thing is you you pick your character but as a group you all have to take a role like who's going to be the leader and that's the mm-hmm. person who keeps track of initiative or mm. like making sure everybody's taking their turns um there's a quartermaster who's in charge of all of the like the rations and okay. um uh that kind of stuff there's the mapper who does all the direction checks and i can't remember the fourth one so there these are like roles one. that like the players are taking on too yes. not just the characters necessarily yes. so you've like involved people at the table in a way that i don't think i see in a lot of other games too like having somebody say like this is you know like keep track of initiative or something because i think we've all been in games where like there's the one person and you're like buddy it's your turn and they're like oh what did everybody else do sorry what should i like where's the guy now who am i fighting you Mm -hmm. know and like so like assigning people those roles kind of gives somebody a buy-in into like the party as a whole too in a way that i haven't really seen Mm -hmm. no and i i really like it too because it's like you know, you also have people who, if you get a group together who has decision paralysis, you can, yeah, you can say, no, <laughs> leader, you have to decide for us what we're doing. Do we go yeah. this way or do we go that way? And like, as a GM, I don't have, they have to talk it out with themselves. And I would have to remind them, I was like, I like that. Stop asking me. <laughs> you I have like a, a you lot. have a leader. <laughs> Uh, it's not me. Um, and then what was the other thing that I was going to say that was really interesting as far as like character, like that stuff was really good. But oh, shoot, I lost it. It's all right. I'm sure Maybe it'll, it'll come, come up back. at some point. No, Maybe. I think all of this is really, really interesting because something that we focus a lot on this podcast and fingers crossed we're going to get back to in the new year um, is talking about helping people be better players because mm. like there's lots and lots of advice for people to like be better GMs right there's tons of podcasts and books and like how to GM a better game and we're like but there's usually more players than GMs and also players like have an influence on how the game goes um and so we talk a lot about like how can you be the best player at the table and Mm -hmm. I feel like this will be interesting as we go through to see like what kinds of things this game adds in that way because it seems to take a lot of the stuff that a GM would normally be doing and keeping track of and arbitrating mm-hmm. um, and and puts a fair amount of it on the players. Yeah. Um, like there's mechanically a, I, too, not just like as a group, like, okay, everybody, let's agree. But like the game says, no, this is how it works. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There, there's, a, it, it was a good experience. Like, I, I mean, I had a good group of players my first game I ran, but I did have to do a lot of the reminding of them. Like, you guys need to talk. Like, you're the ones traveling. Mm-hmm. I'm not I'm not there. <laughs> right. <laughs> so you talk it out with yourselves and figure it out. 
Um, but like it, it, it really did watching them eventually grow as a as a traveling group uh, and then them starting to take ownership of that. I think that's another thing, too, is like the game doesn't really like going back to like what setting you have to decide that for as a group as well. Right. So another thing this game doesn't have, you have your professions, but you don't have like race like mm -hmm. you don't have like oh you're a human you're an elf you're whatever it's it's you can make up whatever so i actually asked at the beginning do you guys want to have like anthrop anthropomorphic like animal characters like do you want to do that and my brother immediately was like yes i'm a little pug man like i'm a little dog <laughs> pug man that's a chef <laughs> and you know that kind of i think not only does it make like it easier on the gm but you get a lot of player buy-in and, and investment if you do this at the beginning that that setting creation that making up mm -hmm. your own like mm -hmm. who lives on this continent you know world who building these, is yeah. like one of the quickest ways to get player buy-in into yeah. a game to do collaborative world building is like in our experience um you know as like very experienced professional <laughs> rpg people um is i mean it is it's one of the quickest yes. ways to get people into a game and say like this is our thing like it's mm -hmm. not a gm coming say i came up with this whole homebrew world ta-da or you having to you know like when i first started playing l5r people saying here's 20 years of lore have fun oh, Lord. like right i know and <laughs> yeah. it's still somehow my favorite game um but you know like it is it's a lot to process and it's a lot to buy into and so like if you can sit down at the table together and be like what do you want in your world in our yeah. shared world then they're already like you're guaranteed that there's something for everybody because mm -hmm. i put it there like yeah. i know that there's something that i want because i made sure of it yeah that was one of my first questions i asked i was like how much of the world building do you guys want to be a part of like are you wanting like how much do you want me to inject into it mm -hmm. and they said we like the if you ask us questions we'll e we'll add we'll either say yes we want to add this or no we don't mm -hmm. but a lot of them were like the majority of people were like we still want to be surprised so if you want to put stuff in that makes sense for our characters we'll like it but we would love the agency to say hey it doesn't make sense or or no um and so we ended up having a really interesting um uh world that we built all together that was really very much like split evenly among yeah. us as far as the creation is concerned. Yeah, that's really cool. I know. Um, I keep referencing ourselves. We've done a lot in like four and a half years. Um, <laughs> four but, and a half years is a long time. Right? It is. Um, but we created like a session zero planner, basically. That and like mm -hmm. one of the questions in there is like for the players and for the GMs, like how much input should we have in scenes? And you know, it's things like, I want you to say, like, okay, you're in a clearing in the woods. And then to say, like, what do you see? And have each player say, like, here's something in this scene that I have noticed. And, you know, like that kind of little interaction back and forth. Yeah. I think is really helpful. That reminds me of one of another unique thing about mm -hmm. Ryutama. And it's in the combat uh, phase where, one, there is a, the leader is the one keeping track of initiative. But a big thing that I, I really appreciated about this game was that it made people get more involved narratively with the battles as well. Like if you had an encounter mm. and it was part of the combat setup is every character has to go around and name one thing that they physically see in the scene, mm. describe it. We write it down. And then in combat, anybody on their turn can use one of those items or objects narratively to then give themselves a boost on their like attack roll, essentially. Oh, nice. Yeah, I love so that. So it's kind of stuff. so it's like, oh, I see an overturned wheelbarrow, or yeah. I see a beehive <laughs> hanging from a, a branch. You know, they could set mm -hmm. up something that then it makes them remember. Oh, I want to do that next mm -hmm. time. Right, and they they all don't have to use the thing that they made up. Uh, everybody, other people can, and it was also fun to see over time as they were growing. People would set up stuff for. Com more combat focused people to mm -hmm. use so it was right. like they were also supporting themselves yeah. narratively in the in the combat which i think makes combat more engaging because it does because i think sometimes you're like uh i don't know i guess i just hit it again like yeah exactly you yeah. know so then it's nice to have those options there to say like okay i can utilize this in an interesting way or now that we've set this thing up, I know that like whoever has that spell that does this thing. Yeah. And, you know, so I'm going to make sure that there's something there so that they can do that. 
Um, mm-hmm. And I, it, it does engage people a lot more and yeah, makes absolutely. combat much more interesting because I don't like combat. Me either. And I'll just say this right now. If you're ever playing a game that I run, I never let combat go more than two rounds because I lose interest. <laughs> so everybody gets two times to spotlight do something and then the monster either just lays down or runs away. Because <laughs> I'm like, I can't deal with it myself. No, no. No, it sounds like you and I need to play a game together. Yeah. I feel like we, we're like on a very <laughs> similar ADHD, wavelength. Yes. yes, like this is taking too long. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, before we can get to creating characters, we usually like to talk about the history of the game and then some concepts and stuff that we need to cover. But um, I looked up the history of this game. It was, it was pretty interesting. It was uh, created by Atsuhiro Okada uh, in 2007. Um, and... It was a it was a Japanese tabletop uh, RPG uh, created as a response to the Dungeons and Dragons boom uh, that happened uh, back around that time period. Once the game hit the region, um, and it didn't receive an English translation until 2014. Yeah, uh, which yeah. is wild. So it took seven years for for uh, a Kickstarter to happen to fund the translation of the book. Um, and then they finally released the a PDF and physical copies in 2015. Yeah, it, it took forever, and I mean, I mean, it kind of makes sense. I, it's it's D and D being as big as it is in America. I don't know if it would have done well until the indie scene started to blow up pretty big yeah. over here. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think about that now, even, and it's like, okay, what you know, what indie games are big, and like, how often are they getting translated? You know, I mean, we don't right. we don't really think about that, but it's like, OK, like how many English mm-hmm. games have been translated into Japanese? Like, yeah. yeah. And I, I remember reading a little bit of the history, too, because I think in Japan they had like RPG cafes and stuff like that, mm-hmm. that they would do stuff. And this is kind of where it got played around. Um, the people who translated it, um, I think. I think they still, well, this, okay, so this will tell you how long I've been in the TTRPG scene. It's like when <laughs> Google uh, Plus was around yeah. <laughs> and the circ- and the, then all the, the circles, circles mm-hmm. there was a huge uh, um, Ryutama uh, Google community and they would put out their own like supplements and stuff. Because I think that there is some sort of OGL for this. Like, I think you can, the yeah. license is that you can make stuff for this game. Don't quote me on it. Do your right. research, <laughs> internet, before you start doing right. this. But I disclaimer, think disclaimer, you, disclaimer, disclaimer. Disclaimer, yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty sure you can make content for Ryutama and sell it. Mm-hmm. Um, Because I was thinking about doing it because I have several uh, modules and several character classes I've made for this game. Mm-hmm. Um, I just haven't put it anywhere. So there was a huge Google community. And then I think now they've moved to Discord. And I was in it for a while, but my guy, I have too many Discords I'm a part of. So I've cold, <laughs> yeah. I've cold a lot of my Discords uh, uh-huh. in the last couple months. But they, it's a really dedicated fan base and people who are making content for it. It's just you have to hunt for it. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm always excited when I see Ryutama at a convention most likely going to be the Indie Press Revolution booth because I think they are the ones that have the licensing to print and distribute it in America. Okay. Um, but it's always like they run out and then it takes a while to reprint. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a it's a tough one to find a print for. I think they're backed up to 2023 sometime in like April, really? I think. Wow. Ooh, Something I like, like that for the actual like hardcover. I s- saw one at my... There I'm was, s- like, there was a batch recently, I believe, yeah. that just recently ran out. Okay. Yes. So maybe I my was, store does have one. I feel like I've seen one at my store. My store has like, oh, I love my gaming store. I was at Gamehole Con <laughs> and uh, I saw like uh, like a stack of them at somebody else's booth. Like they, ha- I think they we had bought wholesale from um, IPR and were selling it at the booth. And it was gone by the time. Oh, no. At the end of the weekend, like all of them had sold out because it's, it is... Yeah. I don't know. It's a very special game to me. Um, I'm really sad because I missed the Kickstarter back in like what 2014. Yeah, because they had a nice limited edition like I'm a sucker foil for a limited edition. embossed. Oh, me too. I love it. I yeah. love a nice uh, limited edition book, and I got to see one in the public uh, in the wild one time, oh. and that was like a rare treat. I took a picture of it because I'm a weirdo. <laughs> but yeah, it, it, it's it's hard to come by, but yeah. Uh, 
I want more people to try it and play it. And I, I, I'm so happy we're talking about it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, I, I'm really thrilled to, to learn about this one. Um, I've been hoping to get a, a hardcover for a while. Uh, oh, they have it? Board Ooh. Game Barrister, Ryan. They have it on their Ooh. website. The As, of As of this recording, there is one somewhere. <laughs> There's one somewhere at a game <laughs> store in the Milwaukee area. <laughs> oh, no. I might have to buy that because uh, this book is gorgeous. It is like the art on this. It, I, I can see why people would be drawn to look at it because yeah. the like the cover is very like, uh, yeah, it's that Studio Ghibli esque like uh, pictures. The but like the soft art pastel through, kind yeah, of yeah, soft yeah. pastels. Mm-hmm. You've got the uh, the nice like combo between like uh, kid friendly and adult like. Uh, I'm almost chibi sort of uh yeah. character types in there. Yeah, yeah, and then like like I love the they they do illustrations for the rules and stuff. They they illustrate what dice are. They they have like little pictures of like characters interacting with the world and like mm-hmm. your status effects and all this stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's really and I would say it is child friendly. Like there is, I mean. Maybe it, it, I I could definitely see this running for kids. I ran it for my sister when she was twelve, I think. I was gonna say my time. kids are like nine and eleven, um, like almost ten and eleven, and I could see this being something that they could definitely get into. Yeah, yeah. I love these little illustrations. They've got like little comics for the roles you can be in the party, and yep. Uh, it's it's just amazing uh, the the way this book is created. So I I can easily see somebody not knowing anything about the game, picking it up based on solely the presentation the cover of the book itself. Like, yeah. yeah, 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 yep, definitely. Now we're all just looking at Rio. Yeah, I know. I was like, like, we're all just like looking at the book right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, before we dive into like the actual character creation process here, uh. Are there any like basic terms and concepts that you think people might need to know to be able to follow along? I know some of it will come up as we're doing things, um, but if there's anything you think people might need to know. Sure, sure. I, a big, I mean, what's really funny, I just opened the book and there's a vocabulary section. So you could also like know what you need to say. But I think if you're familiar with um, RPGs in general, this is a very check heavy. So it'll be like, I want you to do a check. You'll be saying as a GM, I need a some sort of check from you. Mm-hmm. Um, and then that the fumble we talked about, that's a big one. Um, I Other than that, like, you know, you're just your usual stuff. GMs, uh, NPCs, PCs, your party, your roles, um, casting, you know, the Ryujin, casting like a benediction or I can't remember what the other one is called. There's two different types of spells, but there's, a, there's that. Um, I think that's pretty much it. Okay. Can I just say as an aside, there's this, like, in the vocabulary section, when you're choosing your dice, they have a little blurb that one of the little chibi characters is saying is dice are created in so many different colors that it shouldn't be too hard to find the dice that your character's image color, that match your character's image color. Oh. Try using dice that match your character. It'll add to your fun. Uh, that's the thing that we've been doing since I know, well, right? We were at least consistently at the beginning. We would make our characters, and at the end of episodes, we would like go online and find dice that looked like them. Oh, nice! Yeah. That's great. <laughs> yeah, I like the one well. little character that says, "If pointing at the D four that says it hurts when you step on it, so be careful." <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. just it's so charming. Like the the way this book is written is so charming. Yeah. Yes, I love it. Mm-hmm. Oh, I would say HP is uh is your typical, you know, your hit points, but this game also uses MP, mental points. Mm. And that's your magic stuff. So MP, okay. HP, um, those are things that'll come up. Um, I think we'll get into it. Like, we'll do character creation and then, like, the terminology will start to, like, yeah. bubble yeah. up and stuff. Absolutely. All right. Well, sh- should we should we get into it? Do we want to Do we want to make some people? Let's make some people. Let's make some people. Woohoo. Let's make some people. Okay. All right. What what do we need to do first, Amber? So if you uh want to know, listener, what page number player creation starts <laughs> on, it's on page uh 29. And the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna choose a class. Mm. So 
the classes that you can choose from, and they do recommend these first four for like new players. Okay. So the first four they recommend are Minstrel, Merchant, Healer, and Hunter. Those are usually for new players. Mm -hmm. Um, But if you wanted to do something a little bit more advanced or you have more experience playing Ryutama, you can also choose either the Artisan, Farmer, or Noble. Mm. So, and I think... This is just me thinking why they did that. I think artisan, farmer, and noble have a little bit more like stretch for role play stuff mm-hmm. in it, right? Okay. Like, what would you do as a noble? Like, you're gonna have to be a little bit role play a little bit differently than you would uh, maybe a minstrel. You know, mm-hmm. yeah. um, farmer has a lot more. You're managing animals. Okay. And artisan is you are you have to like do more role playing around like crafting and things mm. like that. Gotcha. Oh. Yeah, those are things that you don't necessarily right away associate with like tra- especially farmer. Like, why are you traveling? Like, yeah, yeah. That's a pretty like, sedentary, I mean, like not sedentary, but like uh, stationary. Yes, situation. Mm-hmm. So the minstrel is basically you know, you could have jobs that are like dancer musician minstrel or story you know storytelling that kind of stuff um a, a merchant would be like you were a trader a store owner or a caravan leader uh you can some of your actions would be selling buying and trading so the merchant has a lot of stuff around like negotiation and mm. like talking and and buying stuff like there's actually um ways to um like get prices down when you haggle with store owners and like towns and stuff. Mm. So to kind of go back to minstrel, some of the actions that you would do is like basically playing music that gives buffs. So you're like, you're, you're basically buffing the party to help them get through, you know, kind of like you would see in, I'm trying to think of a wholesome version of Mad Max. And I, <laughs> you know, you know, the, the, whatever that guy was, you're playing the, the, the song during the, the, yeah. What, you oh, know, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Do, doing the thing during the thing. Yeah. During, I gotcha. You know, I you gotta, you know what I'm talking The music during the car, the cars in the desert. Right, okay. Right. Yeah, like, with the, yeah, with yeah. the fire and stuff. It's like, it's like the yeah. crowd, it's the crowd work. It's, it's yeah. the hype yeah. man. The yeah. hype guy. Um, hunters is basically you're going to be like doing trapping and monster hunting and fishing chasing things that kind of stuff and like some of the actions and, and things you'll do is like you could actually harvest things from monsters and get material that you can then use later on or sell mm-hmm. healers very uh, much a what you think of a healer they're going to heal right. you got it got it do first aid mm-hmm. so those are like the four Basic, I think, is what they are. Those were the four, mm-hmm. I think. Uh, minstrel, healer, merchant, and where's the hunter? Other one? Hunter, yep. Farmer is basically, yeah, uh, you, your whole kind of thing is that you have animals <laughs> mm-hmm. that can carry things and you can have a side job as well that can give you some stuff. And then artisans, of course, are like, you could be a shoemaker, a hat maker, a cook. You could do repairs, uh, sewing, that kind of stuff, or craft mm-hmm. things. And then the noble is basically like a knight, a samurai. You are giving orders or protecting or you're, you're studious and you know a lot of like traditions or history and that kind of stuff. Interesting. Okay. And weapons and weapon use is another thing, too, as well. Okay. Okay, so those are that's the first thing you do is you choose a class. So, I mean, have we made any decisions about our our world at all yet? So that's the thing is like it's very interesting, right? Like I think this is like the one area Ryutama could have probably done a little bit better. It's like you should probably do some world building first before you start choosing your character class. Mm -hmm. But I think the way that they do it is literally you get I'm looking at the I'm looking at this. They have actually a really nice step-by-step pages. So I think actually Travelers... Yep, they have Travelers going first, and then the Ryujin makes a scenario. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's interesting. Yeah, it is really interesting. Um, And I know there's some other games, like uh, Descent into Midnight is player first, world second. That's true. Um, And uh, there's a few other games that do world building after character creation, too. Um, So I can see it working. uh, Either way. Either way. Um, I was originally thinking noble, but I don't think that's the type of character I was leaning towards. I just want to be a gnome is all I care about <laughs> right now. <laughs> all right. 
And that's me say, introducing to the world, our world that gnomes exist, whatever right. that means. I was going to say goblins, but that's just, I need to take a break from goblins every <laughs> once in a while. Yes. I just am a goblin of a person sometimes, so. That's like my whole shtick online. It, it, all it, I do it, is it goblin really stuff. Is. But no, I refer just, to myself when I don't take my medication. It's yeah, just like I'm like a bridge troll. Just like hide <laughs> under my bridge, eat all the food. Um, mm. <laughs> I'm gonna do something funny. I think. All right. Do you guys care if I go ahead and just? Yeah, go ahead. And feel free. Go something. Yeah, what do I'm you gonna want? do a gnome. That's just like what I want you to envision. Just imagine a garden gnome. Yeah. Uh, okay. uh minstrel. Okay. All right. Very cool. And I want to see. I want to. I'm gonna try to think about what I want him to actually do, as far as minstreling. <laughs> I'm having a really hard time like deciding what my class is gonna be here. Why am I? I should probably just pick noble, right, Ryan? Like, I mean, noble kind of fits. I think for your play style. I'm like thinking like noble or artisan. Yeah. I might go artisan actually. Okay. I'm going to not pick the, like, smarty pants. Right. You know. <laughs> I think then if you're going to go uh, artisan and we've got a minstrel, um, I mean, Doble does sound pretty cool. It's different than what I was anticipating going in. Um, healer has just uh, amazing art attached to it. Just pick healer, Ryan. Oh, I know I don't want to go like too just, much, but type merchant sounds healer. really useful as well too, um, because that might give us like a because if we're doing minstrel, merchant, and artisan, we've got like a direct path to kind of why we're all traveling together. Yeah, minstrel, merchant, and artisan, artisan. artisan. Oh, yeah, that could be. We really are going to start. Uh, we're trying to start our art co-op. Yeah. Yeah. We need to recruit others mm -hmm. along the way. We're going on tour is what's happening. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's a convention circuit. We got wares to sell. Uh-huh. Uh, but the then, bears. but then, like, <laughs> Noble would be kind of interesting, too, because then it could be, like, uh, uh, maybe, like, a sponsor or yeah. something. Oh, like, like a yeah. patron of the arts. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, I think, I okay, I'm going to go Noble because I don't like capitalism. Okay. Um <laughs> So, oh yeah, so like a feudalism is like so much fun. <laughs> well, it's it's not. I guess I guess it depends on what we what we consider nobles. That's fair in this world. You can right? be. You can. We can do like philanthropy if you'd like. That's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. A, like a nice uh, philanthropist uh, noble who can use a sword. Okay. Okay. So, so we all got our classes. Right. So like if we're looking at the character sheet, it's like class and then it's like blank slash blank. So is that where I yes. like pick the like example, like the job that I do uh, as artist? So it's like artist. Look at the character sheet. Yeah. Oh, actually, you know what? There's an example one in the book here. Hold on. You know what's funny is I redesigned this character sheet for myself. So I'm like, I haven't <laughs> looked at this character sheet in a long, a long time. Uh-huh. Uh, where is your scene the slash at? Uh, like oh here it is yeah like oh. it says like class blank so slash. so the slash is when you level up oh okay so, so you I could end up multi-classing later on cool 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 yeah. eventually okay. you could do two classes gotcha. uh two different or you could just double up you could be like noble noble you just double down on being a noble yeah, yeah. <laughs> you got some you got some new lands you got a promotion you, you're a yeah. duke now yeah exactly and then same with so so the next thing after you do your class is you pick a type so in Ryutama, you get to choose your character's type, and there's three types. T attack type, technical type, and magic type. So mm. attacks are, attack types are basically like you're going to specialize in combat and using weapons. Technical is usually like problem solving, and you can assess situations really well. And then magic is pretty obvious. You can, you can use magic. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. So I went attack. I'm a I'm an attack minstrel. Okay. I love it. <laughs> and in my head he's a puppeteer. Ooh. <laughs> That's really cool. <laughs> I try and figure out a name. I'm always terrible with names. Names come so later on for me. Yeah. Always. I I am stuck between technical and magic type. I'm gonna go with magic. So then I will go with technical. <laughs> and we've got all three covered. Uh-huh. 
call to action. Yeah, like that. Okay. Ryutama, uh, you were not super enthused. You were thinking this this might have been not exactly your jam of a game. Yeah, yeah. So I was not sure. Like, the vibes of this are not my thing, which I think our, our listeners probably know by now. Like, yeah. cozy cozy is not my vibe. Um, Unless it's like Christmas movie RPGs. Well, right, because I like I like the romance yeah, part of that. Yeah, that's true, that's true. Um, yeah, I like, the, I like the romance. I like intrigue. I like drama. Okay. Um, so, you know, cozy traveling game is maybe... Maybe not where it's at for me, mm-hmm. um, but as, as people can hear from this initial discussion, there are a lot of things about Ryutama that I was really intrigued by yeah. um, when we started to kind of learn about it, things about the way the game works that mm-hmm. did really appeal to my my sort of design sensibilities. Yes. Um, so, and I, I I like where where this kind of goes, and I think we have a really great, I can't wait for people to get to the discussion part of this. Um, the we discussion it for everybody, is really but, good. Yeah, we, we really got into some stuff in this episode that I don't think that we get to get to mm-hmm. in a lot of other games. I'm, yeah, absolutely. I'm always continually surprised by that, that like this many episodes in, we're still, even though we ask the same questions pretty much every time, still finding ways to get into things that we haven't gotten to touch on before. Yeah, so. I was I was sitting here thinking, well, we're not going to get into much game design like philosophy because we don't have the designer on. But then like Amber, Amber really pulled out the stops with, uh, some really phenomenal discussion. So uh, absolutely stay tuned for that, um, the the discussion episode, because it's got some really good stuff in there. Yeah, it was great. Mm-hmm. Before we let you go for the week, uh, the Audioverse Award finalists are out and voting has begun. There's a ton of great projects and people nominated, um, including some former guests of ours and me, apparently. You? Um, me, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> So previous guests, Dylan and Aram, were on Series 50 to discuss Dungeons & Dragons. They are the hosts of the Kill Every Monster podcast, um, which has been nominated for lots of different awards. Mm -hmm. Um, And that also includes me being nominated in the featured guest category for my spot on their show. Mm -hmm. Um, You can find the full list of nominees on their website, and voting is open now. Um, Their voting is kind of complicated and don't mm-hmm. super love it mm-hmm. um, because you do have to vote in every category and like they list like unlike the Ennies they don't narrow it down to like five things per category right um, and yeah it kind of randomizes things so finding where the stuff you want is to vote for is tough so yep. um, please stick with it and vote for me if you would <laughs> and, you, and you practically have to do it on desktop you yeah. can't you, there's, yeah. the mobile option is pretty bad even if you use desktop mode on the mobile. Yeah, I was trying to mess around with it on my phone and it's it's, it's tough. tough. So I'm I'm very sorry, dear listeners, it is a challenge. It's something that people have brought to their attention lots of times. And I know a lot of times I like get halfway through voting and I'm like, I can't. I just can't stick with it. Right. Um but I would love it if you would. I was very surprised uh, when I got a message from Dylan that was like, congrats nominee. Um because mm-hmm. I didn't know that they were going to put that in there. So that's yeah, very exactly. cool. It's pretty um, cool. Their website also does have a Spotify playlist with their showcase that has little 15 minute snippets from all of the podcasts that were nominated. So if you are interested in kind of finding out what they are, what they're about, what they sound mm-hmm. like, um, we'll put a link to that Spotify list in our, our show notes as well. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, that would make my day if I somehow randomly got nominated for an award. That would be super cool. That'd be pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. Be pretty excited about that. Mm-hmm. I mean, I already did get nominated. It'd be cool to win. <laughs> It'd be cool to win. Absolutely. <laughs> well, a- as mentioned in our opening, some of you may have noticed ads in your feeds. Uh, this is part of the One Shot Network's move to Megaphone, our new hosting service. Revenue from the ads will help fund the network and its shows like ours. Uh, and the ads don't cover all of the costs. So we also have a Patreon for our show. Uh, And if you don't like the ads, you can get access to ad-free episodes by becoming a patron of Character Creation Cast, specifically at the side quest, uh, the $5 level and up. Uh, You'll get access to your very own feed of ad-free episodes. uh, And those will mirror the regular feed. It just won't have any of the ads, which is really nice. 
Yep. So it'll look just like our regular show feed. Mm -hmm. Um, You'll just get a special one that doesn't have ads in it. Um, And then also access to our our special bonus feed. Mm Mm-hmm. We have Patreon levels available from $1 a month all the way up to $50 a month uh, with tons of benefits available, including bonus episodes, weekly recorded conversations between Ryan and I, where we just catch up on life, sometimes complain about things. Sometimes we ask Taylor Swift to come on our show. Um, We (laughs) have monthly Zoom calls with our patrons. And potentially, you could even have a private game with us. Mm -hmm. You can find all of the info on that at patreon.com slash character creation cast. Plus, if you join, we get to read your name and say thank you out loud on every episode. Mm -hmm. So that's going to start with a brand new patron this week. Mm. A truly special thank you to my very good friend, wonderfully supportive person, Mm -hmm. an amazing guest. Mm-hmm. John Adamus. Absolutely. Um, we are so excited to have you, John. I'm I'm like honestly really, really honored that yeah. you that it, you would give us your money. Thank you, John. It absolutely warmed my heart as well when I saw that come through. And I was like, Amelia. Ah. You're like one of my favorite people, John. <laughs> so thank you so much uh for being here with us, John. Uh and in addition to John, uh, we also like to thank our continuing patrons. Starting with our first ever patron, Lieutenant, you rock. Thank you. DJG, Tigranosaurus, former guest, thank you for your continued support. We're glad to have you here, Eric Bontz. Thank you for supporting. Matt Newton, thank you so much. Shadim Cabal, many thanks to you. Daryl Holiday II, thank you so much. The Shyest Barbarian, uh, many thanks to you as well. We are so happy that you are supporting us, Benjamin Sweeney. Thank you. Lorcan McGinnis, we're happy to have you here with us as well. Thank you. Rob Fletcher, many thanks. Thank you to Kevin Brown. And we appreciate your support and your name, Tentacle Duck. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) I got to say it this time. I know. And (laughs) thank you to all of our future patrons. Uh, You truly make it easier for us to make the show. And we are grateful for your continued support. If you aren't able to chip in financially, you can still do us a huge favor by leaving us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts, Podchaser, and Podcast Addict. We read every five-star review out on our episodes, and we've been sharing them each Friday on our social media. Social media? Yeah. We're on there. We're on social media. We are. We are. Uh, Lots of places. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. With the recent probable, very likely demise of Twitter. Mm -hmm. Um, Please note that we're working on expanding our list of social media locations. Currently, aside from Twitter, you can find us on Instagram at CreationCast, Tumblr at CreationCast, Facebook, Character Creation Cast, or on our Discord, CharacterCreationCast. No, Discord.CharacterCreationCast.com. Mm-hmm. Um, we don't know yet what the hot new thing will be. I'm kind of trying to grab our handle where I can yeah. and where the sign up process doesn't infuriate me. Mm-hmm. Um, We'll try to make sure we're there. If there's somewhere that you feel like we should be that we're not, please let us know. Absolutely. And we can we can try and get there. Um, disc, or, uh, Twitter in the past has sort of been where we've been most active because yeah. that's where I'm most active. Um, mm-hmm. But I am trying to make sure that we're, we're more available at all of the places right now. Yep. So um, please seek us out. Uh, we, we are there. Yeah. Probably. Uh-huh. And, and we've got uh, our own tumblers as well for ourselves. Uh, mm-hmm. So you can seek us out on there if you'd like. Uh, there are links probably in our Twitter bios, and I think mine is somewhere. It's on our Tumblr, too. It, it links to our, oh, our personal go. info, too. Yeah, so um, just head on to our Tumblr and, and check us out there. Um, I'm really enjoyed it, so uh, find us. I still have to remember it's there. Yeah, you'll. we're somewhere on the, the interwebs. Yeah, I'll get there. <laughs> exactly. I'll figure it out. Yep. Wherever everybody ends up. <laughs> yep. <laughs> That's all for today's episode. Thank you for joining us for it. We will be back next week with the conclusion to our character creation portion of the series. So stay tuned for that. Until then, take care of yourselves. Take some time to relax, drink some water, and keep making those amazing people.
Thank you for joining us for part one of this character creation series. We'll be back in part two, picking up right where we left off. Character Creation Cast is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts, this show, and even our press kit. Character Creation Cast can also be found on Twitter at CreationCast or on our Discord server at discord.charactercreationcast.com. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan Bolter, and I can be found on Twitter at Lord Neptune or online at lordneptune.com. Our other host, Amelia Antrim, can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permissions from the podcast they originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. Our main theme music is Hero, remixed by Steve Combs, and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by Ryan Bolter. Further information for the game systems used in today's guest can also be found in the show notes. If you'd like to support our show, find us on Patreon. Get access to bonus episodes, extra outtakes, and much more at patreon.com slash character creation cast. Thanks for joining us. And remember, we find the best part of any role playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We'll see you next time.